Thank you, uh, my dear wife. These, uh, these messages on Sunday mornings we record on, uh, on, use an iPhone and record it. It's nothing fancy, but we put it up on YouTube um, because we got a few folks who watch them and not many, but a few folks. And um, if we want somebody to watch the YouTube videos, we, we have kids come up and they sing and then those YouTube videos, everybody watches them. But when I preach, not many folks watch them. And I understand that. But hopefully it'll be a help to somebody. Today's message is going to be one of those unusual, different, nothing strange or weird, but just different because it's not what I had planned for today. And God has interrupted that by guiding us a different way for today's message. Um, if you want to find the book of Galatians in your Bible, in the New Testament, the book of Galatians is where we'll be mainly reading from. Not only, but... We're going to be reading in the book of Galatians in just a few minutes. So hold your place there. Chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Now, I, I, I asked Chance to help me with this because uh, when we do object lessons, uh, we usually do it for the children, the young people. But I found out that object lessons are usually as good for the adults as they are what you got? Oh, yeah. Chance, get that brain from Brother Jerry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Brother Jerry. I'm just about over this cold thing, but it's every now and then my throat still gets a little trouble. Okay, hang on, Chance. Hang on. I, I haven't forgotten you. Now, I'm going to show you a couple of things here that are just kind of fun and interesting, but they, they, they show us something. Uh, let's see if I can get this thing to work here. I'm supposed to be showing you something up there to help you see where we are. Okay. No. Now? Okay. The name of the message, the title I gave it, I couldn't figure out what to call it. The Laws of Nature. You could even call it the Laws of Physics, if you want. Which all come from the Laws of God. The Laws of Physics were established by God, not people. Laws of Nature may have been discovered by people, by scientists and inventors and people like that. But they weren't, invent they weren't established by them. They were just uh, discovered by people. Does anybody know what this is called? Anybody know? What's its common name? Newton's Cradle. That's, that's the most popular name for it. I should have cleaned it and gotten it ready. It may not work too well, I don't know. Um, it's not a very good one. You have to really get an expensive one to do it, to, for it to work the way it's supposed to. But you know what it does, right? Everybody here knows what this is. You remember those things? Aren't they great? Now, a real good one, and if it's set up properly and it's really made precisely, it will, it will do that for a lot longer, okay? This is a cheap one, and it just does what it does for a few seconds. But it's the, it demonstrates one of the laws of physics that have to do with the storing of energy and the transfer of energy. Also has to do with momentum, the laws of momentum, and movement of objects, and what happens when one moving object hits another one that's equal size, and all of those things. It's complicated. But to me, it's just fun to watch. But it demonstrates a law that God set up in nature, the laws of physics, if you want to call it that. And I know the laws of nature and the laws of physics are a little different, but they all come down to one thing. God established it. It wouldn't work if it wasn't established in 
all of creation for this to happen. It wouldn't work. Okay? I'll keep doing it for a few seconds because it's just fun to watch. Okay? But that's not the only thing I've got. Chance, I'll, I'll call you up this minute. I haven't forgotten. Can anybody tell me what a gyroscope demonstrates? You know? You have one. I know you do. I know you have one. I gave you one. But what, what does it demonstrate? Who can tell me? What is it a demonstration of in, our, in nature that we know about, that we see all the time? We actually live on it. Huh? Say again? Motion. The, for example, it's a really good demonstration of the earth rotating on its axis. And why the earth doesn't just wobble off and go everywhere and other planets, the solar system. It all has to do with uh, something I don't understand. <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt to explain this one because it's way over my head. But you know what a gyroscope is. If you don't, be ready to be amazed, okay? I didn't do that very well. Probably won't work. Let's see. There's a frame, and inside that is a spinning sphere, and it can balance. It can, uh, somehow it doesn't get bothered. It doesn't get bothered by the things around it, okay? I didn't spin it fast enough. But it's supposed to demonstrate how an object that's spinning, that's weighted like that, will not be influenced by whether it, it's out of level or turned this way or that way. It will continue in the same direction it's going. Did you know that gyroscopes are used on ships, in spaceships, in guided missiles, in airplanes, submarines, anything that, any kind of object that needs to be guided or um, directed when there's nothing to reference, nothing to reference to. For example, how would a spaceship know, how would you know where a spaceship is going the right direction? Because I mean, the sun and the planets and the stars are all out of place, you know, and you're traveling through space. You don't have any reference point. You don't know if you're upside down or right side up. You don't know if you're going this way or going that way. And the gyroscope helps them stay on course. Matter of fact, many gyroscopes, not like this, of course, but sophisticated there are different kinds of gyroscopes. I won't get into that. Gyroscopes demonstrate something about God's creation, how God put the earth spinning on its axis, and that helps the earth, helps the earth stay in its orbit and stay on course where God put it. The earth is a giant gyroscope. That's oversimplified, but that's all I'm going to say about it because that's the only thing I can understand. Now, Hang on. Come up here, Chance. Now, here's a demonstration of something called static electricity. I have no idea what that is. He said, I have no idea what that is. I heard some of you kind of chuckle. What does static electricity do? It does what? Listen, listen, now wait a minute. Say it again. Shock. It shocks you. So what I need you to do, you stand over here. Stand right there. I need you to hold on to the end of that. I'm going to hold one end and you hold the other. Now wait a minute. Are you sure? You think you should? Sure. This is a demonstration of static electricity. How static electricity can go from one human body to another. Are you ready? All right. It didn't work. Hold my hand. <laughs> Hold on to it. How about that? 
Now, should I give him this to play with during preaching? No. <laughs> oh, my. You're a good helper. Thank you. <laughs> Static electricity transferred from one human being, human body to another. That's a, just a gadget to demonstrate. I just thought it was fun. But anyway, they don't ask me how it works. I don't know. But there are all kinds of laws of nature, laws of physics that we may not understand all about it, but some very intelligent, some very uh, bright people have understood and have discovered some laws of, that have been established in nature and the universe and this earth and the world and life that never change. What about the law of gravity? Does the law of gravity, can, can anybody defy gravity? Literally? Permanently? Can you live without being affected by gravity? Of course not. Every day, um, we are affected by gravity. The longer we live, the more we're affected by gravity too, aren't we? After you've lived a few years, you start understanding that gravity is pushing down on your body, isn't it? Yeah. We call it weight, but it's really not our weight, folks. It's just gravity, okay? It's not our weight. It's just gravity. Don't, don't, so don't be upset about your weight, okay? That's why I don't feel bad about myself at all. It's just gravity. Of course, some of us have more gravity than others, but I'm, I'm struggling from gravity all the time. But these laws of physics, laws of nature, are things that don't change. They're constant. Now, they're not that way because they evolved that way. They're not that way because it just happened. They're that way because they've been established by the creator of everything, the one who created nature, the one who created this world, the one who created the universe. He established all these things, and they're constant. They don't change. Um, I, I don't have time right to tell you a story about a, about a, uh, a group who went the first manned flight to go to orbit the moon. Apollo 8, I believe it was. And they orbited the moon. I forget how many times, 10 times or something like that. And then they came back to the earth. And for them to, for them to, I, I, never mind. I'll start telling it and then I'll get stuck. Research it yourself and find out just how mathematically accurate they had to be in order to, to leave Earth's orbit in a spaceship that's traveling 25,000 miles an hour and, and, and go to, to get into the moon's gravitational pull and orbit the, the moon. And the moon is traveling at over 2,000 miles an hour and they're traveling at 25,000 miles an hour and they've got to intersect with the moon and just do it just right, perfectly, in order to not be cast out into space and be able to hit the moon and then come back and all of that. It's just fascinating. Fascinating. But do you know how they could do it? Because everything is constant. Everything's constant. The speeds are always the same. They know exactly every day, every year, they know exactly where the moon's going to be because it always does exactly the same thing and it cycles every month, every year. It's been doing it for hundreds and thousands of years. It's been doing it not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds and thousands of years, it's been doing the same thing. And we've tracked it and we, we see it because God set up those laws to not change. Now, what in the world has that got to do with the Bible? What's it got to do with us in this Christian life? Well, there are some laws that God has set up, and I'm not talking about Old Testament laws of Moses. That's not what I'm referring to, even though that's established by God as well. We're not under those laws anymore. We're under the law of grace now, thankfully. But there is something that God has established, and I'm just going to touch on one thing. One. The law that God set up called the law of sowing and reaping. The law of sowing and reaping. You ever heard of sowing and reaping, Chance? If I said, Chance, I have a bag of grass seed. Seed that grows grass. And we're going to go out here beside the church and we're going to sow some grass seed. You would have a, a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about, wouldn't you? 
You wouldn't. Okay? Then I'll explain it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open that bag, and I'm going to say, okay, Chance, get you a big handful of grass seed, and I want you to go out there, and I want you to spread it all over the yard. I know that's not how you do it, but that's what we're going to do. And we're going to spread that grass seed all over the dirt. Okay? And what's going to happen after some time? What's going to grow? Strawberries? No, grass. Grapes? Grass. grass. Why will grass grow? Why? Yeah, because it was grass seed, right? It's seed of grass. It's exactly right. So when you sow something, that's what grows, correct? If you want strawberries, you plant strawberries, right? If you want grass, you sow grass seed, yeah. See, it's, and, and, and I know that during the days when the Bible was written, um, a lot of the people that the Apostle Paul would have been writing to in the churches there, especially in the church at Galatia and other places like that, a lot of them would have been well acquainted with growing their own food, growing crops, raising animals. So this uh, agricultural atmosphere and culture was normal. Everybody knew, everybody, even the city people knew how things grow because they had to grow their own crops or buy them from farmers. So they knew where things came from. And the thing of sowing a seed and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. And finally the plant grows and it grows something that you reap, you harvest. They understood that. Well, folks, today we're going to see what God says about the law of sowing and reaping and how it's so important for us. So important. All right? You reap what you sow. You ever heard that said? Yes. You ever heard it? Okay. Let's read it, okay? Galatians chapter 6, starting at verse 7. I'd like to read the whole context to you, but I'm going to trust you to start back at verse 1 and read at least down through verse 10. That's the context. But let's just start at verse 7. And Paul, the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, I know there's a whole lot more to that text and to the context than what I've read today, but I'd like to narrow it down to one specific aspect of sowing and reaping. And I'm going to show you different, different um, principles that go with this. Real short message, nothing complicated, and certainly nothing hard to understand. And that's why I asked Chance to stay in the service today, and I want him to be listening because he can understand this. So, folks, we can too. All right? So let's, let's get started into God's Word. Sowing and reaping. Oh, by the way, I wrote myself a note. I almost forgot it. Let me show you something. I'm not talking about karma. Not karma. That's not what this is. The law of sowing and reaping is not karma. Even that's what people call it today. And I even hear Christians say, uh, oh, I saw karma uh, in action today. I, I've heard it many, many, many times. A lot of people say it, and most people say it without even thinking about what it is, because that's what we hear everywhere, don't we? Everybody says it. It's everywhere. You hear it. I mean, the politicians say it. The news says it. YouTube says it. Everybody says something about karma, right? And uh, it's not karma. Have you ever looked at the definition of karma? you're going to have trouble because everywhere you look, you're going to see a different definition because it depends on who defines it. But here's a general, very general definition. And I took this from a dictionary, quoted it word for word. This is one of the definitions from Hinduism and Buddhism because that's where karma comes from. It's a religious word. All right. The sum of a person's actions in this and previous states of existence, it's talking about reincarnation, 
viewed as deciding their fate in future existences. Reincarnation. All right? That's what this is all about. That's what karma is about. Now, it depends on who, which religion and which, which sect of that religion and where they live and what country it is. But usually in India somewhere is where this sort of originated. It's, it's hard to trace it down. And you're not going to get a, a real exact definition because every, every person, every group has got a little bit different version of it. But this is a general idea. Matter of fact, can I just say it this way? It's not something Christians ought to be promoting. All right. And we may use the word, we may say it, but we need to be careful about it because we'll convince people that we believe in karma. Okay? That's wrong. We don't believe in karma. It's not in the Bible. Matter of fact, it's against the Bible because it rules God out. It takes God out of the picture. How many remember uh, years ago, and this is gonna we're gonna find out who's old in the room, all right? How many remember an old TV commercial? You'll remember this, Miss Tammy, you're old. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. How many remember an old TV commercial about margarine? It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Mother Nature. Remember that? Yeah. I mean, I don't remember it. I knew, I knew, I saw it. <laughs> I saw it on her face. I saw it. He said, I don't remember that. She's, I'm, I'm just kidding. Just pick on me. Thanks for letting me pick on you. And that was a pagan view of, 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 uh, it's not nice to mock God type idea because that's what the scripture says. Okay, verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. And that was kind of the pagan viewpoint of the world in that TV commercial. Anyway, that's beside the point. Let's get into the scriptures here. Sowing and reaping is a law God established in physical life and spiritual life. Both. It applies in every part of life. Your physical lives with your family, your children, your, uh, your work, your job, uh, everything you do. But it also is a, a, a spiritual law as well. And I'll show you that. We'll break it down. Um, notice the first thing that God tells us through the Apostle Paul in verse 7. Be not deceived. And... I didn't write anything down about it, but I, I just want to remind you, be not deceived because deception is the greatest tool that Satan uses, the devil uses, to deceive people. And you know what? One of the things that Satan tries to deceive us about, he will try to convince you that what you fear or what you believe or what you think is not real. For example, I wonder how many people in the world believe that Satan, the devil, is a fellow in, in red pajamas with a, a pitchfork and a long tail and horns. You know? I wonder how many kids think that that's all it is. They think, oh, that, that's... They see a, a drawing or a, a, a picture of somebody dressed up like that and say, that's the devil. Right? If you saw a picture like that, would you say, oh, they're, they're showing you the devil? I mean, you may not believe that's what he's like, but you understand what it means, right? It's a symbol. Why? Because he's trying to deceive you. Did you know that the devil's going to look just like me and you if he appears to you? He won't appear to you in a body form, but he's not going to look scary is what I'm trying to say. He's going to look like your friend. Yeah, he's going to look like a friend. He's going to look like a friend who's going to be dangerous to you, going to do harm to you, going to be bad to you. Because the devil, he's a liar, he's a deceiver, and he never shows you what he's really like. But God says, be not deceived, because the deceiver will always try to deceive you, try to fool you. But God says, don't be deceived, don't believe a lie. And what's that lie? That you can, because we live in the age of grace especially, we can live our lives any way we want, and 
It doesn't matter. Especially as New Testament, God's children in the age of grace were saved by grace, kept by grace. Our works don't affect our salvation. It doesn't make us lose it, all that stuff. But hold on. That means we can just live any way we want. It has no effect. No, it does not mean that. Which is, it is a lie. You're deceived if you think you can just live any way you want. And it doesn't affect your relationship with God. It doesn't affect anything in your life. It's okay. You're deceived. And God says, be not deceived. Because God is not mocked. God will not be mocked. To mock means to uh, taunt God, to tempt God, to tease God, to listen to God but not obey him, to do things in front of God without fearing any result, without fearing any problems. Like a Christian who says, I, I'm saved now, I'm a Christian now, I can live any way I want, doesn't matter. That's mocking God. It's mocking God. God says, I'll not be mocked. You can't, you can't say you're my child and then live any way you want. I will not be mocked. God is not mocked. He didn't say, don't mock God. That's not what he said. Because you can't mock God. Because God's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, all-encompassing. God is God. You can't mock God. It's not possible to mock him. He says, God is not mocked. That which means those who think they can try to mock God, they think they can get away with whatever they want and have no consequences of it. Get this thing out of my ear, it's bugging me. We have walkie-talkies, and, and this one's bugging me. When we try to mock God, we're not going to be successful. God says, God's not mocked. What's he not mocked about? Okay. God established this law called sowing and reaping. And he tells you, what, what is this you're not to be mocked about or not to be deceived about? That God's not going to be mocked about. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 7 tells us very clearly what Paul is talking about. God's not mocked because if, uh, if, you, mock, if you sow something in life, you're going to reap that. Whatever you do in life, that's what's going to come back at you in your physical life and your spiritual life. God is not mocked. It is a law that God established that if a man sows something, he's going to reap it. It's established by God. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now hold on. Let's see what else we can learn about this. Okay? I told you I got three points. Let's see what number two is. We reap the same things we sow. What does he say? Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We reap the same thing we sow. Okay? What you sow in life is what you're going to reap. He, he gives the illustration or the example you sow to the flesh you're going to reap the flesh and what is the flesh what is the, the harvest of the flesh is corruption in the in the very simple terms a person doesn't have to be saved to understand this a lost person can understand this you you sow anger you for example you behave angrily towards somebody well, usually, what are you going to get back? You're going to get anger back. Yeah. You sow hatred towards somebody, you're usually going to get hatred back, right? Uh, you sow kindness towards somebody, usually people will be kind back. Not always, I understand that. But, uh, and I'm just using examples just to kind of get the idea. You, you, show, you sow criticism, you're always critical of people. Uh, believe me, you're going to get some criticism back, right? It's just part of life. You respect others, usually people will respect you, really. Uh, you, show, you show yourself to be generous, you'll find out that a lot of people can be generous to you because they just respect you and they appreciate your generosity. You sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. 
so to the flesh you reap corruption. What is he talking about? This is why I need to break it down just a little bit, okay? So to the flesh and reaping corruption seems like it's different, but it's really not. Because um, if you give the best of your, and I'm talking about in the physical life, you give the best of your time, the best of your energy, uh, the best of your resources, to the parts of this life that emphasize the comfort, the pleasure of, the, the enjoyment of, the fulfillment of, the excitement of the physical body, the flesh, then what are you going to get back? You'll reap corruption. If, I, if what's most important to a person is making their body happy and doing what feels good, as, as the world will tell you, doing what feels good, then you're not going to, you say, well, that's going to make me feel good. That's what I'm going to reap. I'm going to reap enjoyment and, and excitement and, and pleasure. Hmm, that's what you think. But the end result, we're talking about long-term results. What's going to happen? If that's all you care about is just this life, just this body, just the pleasure that you can enjoy, if that's the only thing that's important to you, the Bible calls it corruption. Um... You'll reap corruption. Now, because the Bible is in our, our old precious King James Bible is written in Old English, sometimes I use a dictionary to get ideas of new modern words to help people get, get the whole idea. Because the word corruption to us, we understand politicians are corrupt, right? <laughs> we understand what corruption means. Liars, you know, dishonest, right. But corruption means more than that. And if you, if you look in dictionary, I looked, I looked in three dictionaries and I read all, and believe me, the definitions for corruption are long because it goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. Did you know I didn't find one word or one explanation or one definition that was positive? Every one of them were, were very, very negative. Nasty. Let me read you a few words. Dishonesty, selfishness, self-centered, rottenness, decay, Sounds like good character traits, right? No, absolutely not. If, uh, if, if you had a daughter and she brought her, her boyfriend to meet you and, and the only way you could describe him was uh, dishonest and selfish and self-centered and rotten and decay and all this, that wouldn't be very positive, would it? No. You'd say, I don't think he's got very good character. <laughs> he had no character. But anyway... The dozens and dozens of words I found defining corruption, none of them were positive. Nothing you reap from this life, the physical part of this life, qualify as being positive. Short term, it may seem so. The Bible even says that sin has pleasure for a season. There may be pleasure in sin for a short time, but the end result of it. I mean, why do you think people use drugs to get high? Because the immediate result is they feel good. Immediate. Well, what's the long-term result? Is it, is it they still feel good? Hmm. What's the end result? Corruption. Rottenness. Decay. Decay, that, it's talking about dying. It's talking about death. Rottenness. Nothing good about it. What you're going to reap from sowing to the flesh is all bad. It may be immediate result might seem pretty good, but the end result is never positive. There's nothing wrong with eating a good meal because you like the taste. I enjoy food, as you can tell. I enjoy food. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying a nice meal because you enjoy the flavor. That's okay. That's not what I'm talking about, catering to the flesh doesn't mean you shouldn't enjoy something. I, I enjoy uh, feeling the sun the, uh, of the early in the morning when the sun's first coming up and it's chilly and that warm sun hits you and all of a sudden the aches and pains don't hurt so bad because that warm sun is warming you and it feels a little better. There's nothing wrong with enjoying some pleasure. That's not what I'm talking about. doesn't mean you have to go around suffering all the time. That's not what this is about. 
What is it you sow to? What is it you spend the best part of your life doing? Because that's the most important thing to you. It shouldn't be the things that have to do with the flesh. Let's, let's look at the other side. Sowing to the spirit. And notice the Bible says to the spirit. And the word spirit has a capital S. Notice that. Pay attention. Because capital S in the Bible always indicates the spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. When you sow to the spirit, you reap life everlasting, he says in this text. All right. Verse 8, he that soweth to the flesh, uh, to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth in the, uh, to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now there, are, I think I can break it down into two things, two ways. You say, how, what's he mean by you, you sow to the Spirit, the Spirit of God, you're going to reap life everlasting. Does that mean that's how you get saved is by sowing or doing things about to the Spirit of God or with the Spirit of God, it's confusing, but it's really not. It's very simple. Let me show it to you. John chapter 3 and verse 36. John chapter 3 and verse 36. Let me read it to you. Mark it down, read it in your Bible, but please make sure you look at it yourself sometime, either now or later, but make sure you'll check it yourself. Make sure I'm telling you right. I believe there's a literal, the literal understanding of eternal life with God is meant here. But it's not the only meaning, all right? It's not the only thing. I believe it's, it's got two meanings. It's, it's a, a lot of scripture has dual meanings. And I'll show you. Because you can take the rest of scripture and see how it fits with that and then get fuller understanding. John chapter 3 verse 36 is one of those really simple understand, uh, verses to understand about this literal understanding of eternal life. John 3 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Well, I believe the literal understanding of that verse is you sow to the Spirit, doing the will of God, obeying the Spirit of God is most important to you as a child of God, because remember, he's writing to Christians. The book of Galatians is written to Christians. You've got to have the context there. He's writing to save people. So writing to a Christian and telling Christians, you sow to the flesh as a Christian, you're going to reap bad things because that's not supposed to be most important to you. But as a Christian, you spend most of your life, most important parts of your life, most important part of your day, most important part of your resources, most important part of your thought life. Everything should be, the most important part should be spent Sowing to the Spirit. You can go sit with Miss Glenda if you want to, Chance. Yeah, go sit with Miss Glenda. It's okay. Thank you. And you sow to the Spirit. You do the things that are pleasing to God with your life. Then that just shows that God has given you everlasting life. He saved you, and that's the way you're going to spend your life. Makes sense. That's a literal understanding of it. But I believe there's a dual meaning. Let me show it to you. This is a verse that gets read and overlooked. Romans chapter 6. I don't know how many of you have read this verse and probably don't even remember it. And I'll show you why. It's one of those verses we read over and say, I'm not sure I understood that. And because we don't understand it too clearly, we just kind of leave it behind and don't study it, don't try to break it down. Well, here, it's a very simple verse and it's beautiful and it connects to... When you sow to the Spirit, you reap life everlasting. The people who sow to the Spirit spend their, the most important part of their life, most important part of their resources, most important part of their thoughts. I mean, it's most important to them because they're a child of God. They spend that, putting that emphasis on living for God, obeying the Spirit of God. Then they enjoy... In effect, they enjoy eternal life in this life. They enjoy a little bit of heaven in this life, in a sense. They enjoy the peace of the Holy Spirit, even during times of trouble. They enjoy the joy 
that the Holy Spirit gives you even when you're sad. You still have joy there. Even during hard times, you can still have joy. They understand what it means that God is faithful to you, so you, you try to be faithful to God. They've had that understanding of what it means to sow to the Spirit, because that's what they give their life to, is living for God. Well, they reap life everlasting, which is on earth, they get to reap some of it, a little bit of heaven here, plus the end of it is everlasting life. Let's read the verse. Romans 6, verse 22. Paul says, and, and you really, you need to read six or seven verses before and the rest of the verses after to get the full meaning of this verse. So I challenge you, read the context. Verse 22 says, but now, Paul says, but now, talking about after you're saved and after you start living for God, you're sowing to the Spirit now, but now being made free from sin, that's when you got saved. If you're a Christian, if you've been saved, you've been made free from sin. Doesn't mean you don't sin anymore, but you're not accountable. You're not guilty of that sin before God now because you've been forgiven. All right, been made free from sin. And what's the result of that? And become servants to God. Been made free from sin. You're not under the penalty of sin anymore. You're not going to go to hell now. Now you become a servant to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness. What fruit? You sow to the Spirit and you reap. There's your fruit. You reap life everlasting. And he says, you have your fruit unto holiness. What is the fruit that a Christian reaps? What's the fruit that a person sees in their life when they live for God? They start living a more holy life. I didn't say we're sinless. No, 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 no. Nobody's sinless except the Lord Jesus. But we start living, we try to, our goal in life is to live a holy life. That's our command from God. God says, be ye holy for I am holy. God expects his children to live a holy life, a life of holiness. Yes. Well, I can't do that. I'm a sinner. I, I, I could never live my life without sinning. I know that. I'm a preacher, and I can't live my life without sinning neither. That's why I'm depending on God's grace every day for forgiveness of my sins, just like you need to. But listen, holiness is something God expects in his children. Holy thoughts. That's why we constantly battle with Bad thoughts and good thoughts. He expects holy thoughts. A thought life that's holy. He expects us to, the, the reactions of a Christian, the, the re, re, uh, what do you call it? The responses we have toward, in situations to people should be holy, not wicked, not fleshly. All kinds of things. Let's keep going. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end, what's the end? Everlasting life. So he connects it all. You've been made free from sin, verse 22, Romans 6. But now being made free from sin, you got saved, became servants of, to God. That's living the Christian life. The result of living the Christian life. And you have your fruit unto holiness. God helps you live your life. And little by little, what is it we say around here? God doesn't expect you to sin, be sinless, but God expects you to sin less as you, as you grow and as you learn. That's what he's talking about. That's the holiness he's talking about. And the end, everlasting life. He ties it all together. You sow to the Spirit, you reap life everlasting. It's very clear. It's very easy to, to comprehend it once you see the other scriptures connected with it. It makes it clear. Now, number three. I said we got three. This is it. Principles of sowing and reaping. Very quick. Let's go through them. The principles. Here are some principles. The first principle is found in Job uh, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. <coughs> I'm going to just read the text to you. Write them down, please. If you're quick and you can turn in your Bible, go ahead, but I'm going to try to be fast because I'm, I'm running late. Number one principle is we reap more than we sow. Okay? You reap more than you sow. If you put one grain of corn in the ground, if it grows... Are you going to get one grain of corn out of it? No. How many ears, how many grain of corn are on an ear? Does anybody know? I knew, but I've forgotten. Did you know it's a consistent number? How many rows are on an ear of corn? It's always the same. 
It's very consistent. How many rows around you, around your corn? It's consistent. And uh, how many kernels of corn you're going to get from one stalk? It's going to be between this number and this number. It's always consistent. It's never exactly the same, but it's consistently in that range. Okay? But you don't just get one. You always get more than you planted. You put one seed in the ground, you get a whole bunch. Well, folks, that's the good part. The negative thing is, if you sow to the flesh, you're going to get a lot more back than you sowed. You really will. I know that's, I hate to be negative, but um, most of us, we expect God's blessing because we're living under grace, and God's blessings are always more than we deserve. That's his grace, that's his love toward us. He gives us, he gives us a lot more than we are good, okay? We can't be good enough to earn the things he gives us. He gives us a lot more love, a lot more goodness than we give to him. So you reap a lot more than you sow. But it happens in the bad too. You you sow corrupt you sow to the flesh, you're gonna reap a lot of corruption, a lot of nasty, a lot of filth, a lot of junk, a whole lot. Job four verses eight and nine says, Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity, this is what Job said, even as I have seen in his life experience, they that plow iniquity, iniquity is another word for sin, they plow iniquity and sow wickedness. They reap the same, he said. Reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of their nostrils are they consumed. Hmm, sounds like they reap corruption. Hosea, an Old Testament minor prophet, Hosea chapter 8, verse 7 says, For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. You know what a whirlwind is in the Bible? What would you imagine a whirlwind would be? Tornado. We call them tornadoes. Okay? In the Bible, a whirlwind is mentioned every now and then, but it's not one of these little whirlwinds. He's talking about, he's talking about a devastating, damaging storm. A tornado, we call them. Okay? You sow the wind, they shall reap the whirlwind. Hosea chapter 10, the same book of prophecy, chapter 10, verse 13. Ye have plowed wickedness. Ye have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because thou didst trust in thy way. Some folks will, will understand they're gonna, that all this bad stuff they're putting out in life, the way they're living is going to come back on them, but they don't care. They don't care. They want to they wanna continue it. They're not going to be convinced to do otherwise. Proverbs chapter 22. And I, the, the book of Proverbs is always full of wisdom. It's a book of wisdom. So not only do you reap more than you sow, but you reap later than you sow. Sometimes it takes a while, but it's going to come back. It's going to come back. Um, so you reap it later. Proverbs 22, verse 8. He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. You know what vanity means? Emptiness, void, worthlessness. Worthlessness. Of no worth. Miss Glenda, you remember that song that we used to sing with the kids years ago in children's ministry? that we got from Patch the Pirate about the boomerang. That story, I'm not asking you to sing it. Do you remember it? You know what I'm song, song I'm talking about. Years ago when we were working with kids and when our kids were small, that was a long time ago, um, there was a, a children's story that our kids used to listen to and it was about um, this group going through Australia and they learned about the law of the boomerang. The law of the boomerang. You know what a boomerang is, right? You throw it, and if you do it right, and it's a good quality boomerang, what's it supposed to do? Come back to you. Come back to you. Yeah. The law of the boomerang was, uh, be careful of the law of the boomerang because it'll come back and get you. It'll come back and get you. Okay? And uh, that's, that's what the story was teaching the kids. You know, be careful. Don't you soap. What you sow, you're going to reap. Because that's, that's what the Bible says. See, uh, Proverbs 22, 8, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity. Here's another Proverbs. Chapter 1, verses 29 through 31. Let me read it to you. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 29 through 31. For that 
for they that hated knowledge, they didn't want to be taught anything. You ever run anybody who doesn't want to be taught something? They just don't want to learn anything? They already know everything? He that, for they that hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel. They wouldn't accept any of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. You're going to reap what you sow. Now, one last text. I'm finished. Back to where we started. Galatians chapter 6. Starting at verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth of the, to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Thankfully, God says... Don't give up trying to live for God. Don't give up trusting God to bless you. Say you've been living for God for years and you're just waiting for God's blessings. You know, you've probably been blessed of God and you just don't know it, don't see it. Because you're, you know why we don't see God's blessings? Because we're looking at our problems too much. You know, get your eyes off your problems, get your eyes on God. That I remember, I, this is a good illustration, but it's a true story. A few years back, some of the kids in the church uh, brought, they made me some presents, some little gifts they wanted to make for the preacher. And they, one of them brought me a bookmark, and I've still got it. It's on my desk. And that bookmark said, don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big God is. That meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me. When, we, when our kids were tiny, and our, our, we had two boys and two girls, and our two boys were up, you know, big, big toddler age. And I remember um, back, it was back when we didn't have car seats and seat belts that we worried about, you know. And our kids used to ride in the back seat standing up. <laughs> you know, I mean, remember those days. <laughs> and they used to ride in the back of the pickup truck too, yeah. Yeah, it's just normal. Um, but I remember one of our, our oldest son, he was standing in the back seat and we were driving down the road and he was, he learned a song. And of course we're hillbillies from East Tennessee and you know, do what, do what you want when you're in the mountains, right? He's standing in the back seat and he's singing and he's singing this song he learned in church. And the song is, he's able, God is able. He's able, he's able, I know he's able. I know my God is able to carry me through. And he used to sing that song in that little kid's voice. And he's 40 something years old now and he's this tall and you know, he's not a little kid anymore. But I used to ask him, I'd say, hey Joshua, sing that song for me. And you know what folks? That song from that little kid was an encouragement to his dad. Because we were in a ministry and there were a lot of hardships in ministry, a lot. And every now and then, I just need encouragement. And I'd say, Joshua, sing that song. And I'm so glad Mama taught him the songs like that and helped him, helped him learn songs about God. And he would sing that song. And I'd say, sing it again, Joshua. Sing it loud. And it just it encouraged me. It just cheer me up. I'd say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Don't be discouraged. Be constant. Be consistent. Live for God because God's law does not change. The law of sowing and reaping. You sow to the Spirit. You trust God in your life. God will bless you in this life to give you a little taste of heaven. May not happen all the time, but every now and then, when you're in deep despair and you're going through a dark day, God's going to give you a little hint of joy and peace in your heart that you couldn't have gotten anywhere but from God. You're going to open the Bible and you're going to read one little verse, and all of a sudden, God's going to say... Gave you what you needed. That's what you needed right there. Or you're going to have, hear a little kid singing, he's able, he's able. God's going to give you what you needed. You're going to hear somebody say something. Somebody's going to walk up to you and say, 
been praying for you today. I just feel like the Lord wanted me to pray for you. And you're going to say, God, thank you. You reminded them to pray for me because you know what I'm going through. He's going to give you what you need in this life. But if you're so into the flesh, if you're living your life for what's important to you in this world, this worldly things, please beware. You reap what you sow. And when you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. And it's not good. It's decision time, folks. What are we going to live for? We're going to live for God. Or we're going to live for the flesh. Are we going to live for God, sow to the Spirit, or are we going to sow to the flesh and reap corruption? All of us have to make that decision. Everybody, preacher included. What are we going to live for? Would you stand with me? Dear Father, thank you for these dear folks. Thank you that they're patient, they're understanding with the preacher. But dear Father, help us to not be in such a hurry to get out of here that we forget how important it is to listen to your Holy Spirit. To listen to your word. Dear Father, help us to realize that the most important thing right now in this moment is that we make sure our hearts are right with you, our sins are forgiven. So Father, please convict our hearts that every Christian, every born again person in this room would confess every sin that you're, you have uh, convicted their hearts of and that we would be willing to confess it to you, trusting you to help us turn from it and give us that cleansing power of your Holy Spirit that you promised in the Bible. But Father, if there's anybody in this room who's not saved yet, not sure of their salvation, don't know for sure they're going to heaven, please do that convicting power, a powerful voice that only you can do to show us that we need to be saved. And Lord, I pray that Anybody who's not saved yet would choose to trust you right now by asking for your forgiveness, asking you to mark them down in your Lamb's Book of Life in heaven as one of your children. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If God's spoken to your heart today, will you please make sure that you do business with the Lord before you leave this building? Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being